Okay, so now what I want to demonstrate, um, it's quite a straightforward pair of commands actually. Um, it can be quite important when you um, are dealing with pools that are active. Uh, generally, when you install ZFS for the distribution, it'll include scripts to um, what they call import and export the pools, so they're um, set active and deactivated cleanly. Um, now some might just sync them and unmount the data sets that are available but leave the pools active. So in fact I could show you that as well. Um, uh, if I run the ZFS command by itself, um, if I can find it, yes, there's two commands here, mount and unmount. So you can mount and unmount individual file systems while a pool's active. So if I look at the current situation I've got here, I can actually type in ZFS unmount test slash test, which is the data set I've got. Oh, okay, it's busy because I'm sitting inside it. Let's try that again. And now if I do ZFS list, um, well, it shows us it's still part of the pool, obviously, but if I go to my user and do cd test slash test, well, I can do that, but there's nothing there because df minus h, you can see it's not actually mounted. Um, so the data on that data set is safe. It's been unmounted. It can't be written to or... Um, as you see, you can't unmount it while there's, there's um, file handles attached to it. And conversely, we can remount it using the mount command. And ZFS list, list shows it's still there. DF minus H shows it's now been mounted, it's part of the file system. And of course, as you'd expect, we can go back into it and the data's back there again. The trouble with just mounting and unmounting data sets is that if you remove the, the devices that constitute a pool to put them into another machine, um, you'll have problems trying to get access to the pool because basically it thinks that the um, pool is still active. You, you need to deactivate the pool before you can move it. And one of the features of ZFS is that it's ignorant of um, endianness, so you can move the devices, the disks between um, systems that have big endianness and little endianness, and it just takes care of that. It transparently um, converts uh, the endianness of data on the disk um, so that everything all works. Um, but the one thing you must do when you're transferring drives between different systems is you you must export the pool you can't leave the pool active so it wouldn't be any good just to unmount the um, data sets you have to actually export them and to export them it's just as simple as doing export and the name of the um, pool that you wish to export and what it does it just shuts down the pool so if you do Z pool list now, you can see there's no pools available because there's nothing attached. So in theory, I could remove the disk from this machine, put them in another machine, and import the pool um, and all the relevant uh, data sets that are associated with that pool will be um, activated and made available on that system. To Import the pool, it's just a case of said pool import and the name of the pool that you wish to import. And what this does, it's taking some time because it's got to scan each of the disks in, in VDEV, each of the blocks, block devices, to see which one matches uh, the test pool and it imports those. So if I had several disks with several pools on it would only activate the pool that I specified 
Um, if you do Z pool import by itself, it will tell you, it will scan all the disks again, but this time it will tell you what pools it, it's found across all the disks and give you the option to import them, which I think we've seen earlier on in one of the videos. There's no available to import because this is the only um, pool that I've got available. So if I export this one, uh, it's quite handy the import command because if you go to the machine, you know if it's it's got a, a, a pool on there, a Z pool on there, but you can't remember what it was called. If you just do Z pool import, as I say, it will scan the disks and locate any pools that it could it can import and let you know what they are. So as you can see now, it says I've found a pool called test. It tells me what the VDEVs are, what the devices are under each VDEV. And it even tells me that I can import the pool using either its name or its identifier. And we've seen this before where we destroyed the pool earlier on and um, where it found several pools with the same name because it's ambiguous, it doesn't know which pool we're referring to, you have to import by the um, identifier. So I could import by the identifier if I wanted to, but that's a bit hard to type in a, a long, I don't know what's that, about 16, 20 digits. I'll just use the name, it's, it's told me it, it works. So I can import right, like that. So as I say, if you um, the scripts with if you're using a distribution where they provided a package, the scripts that it that they supply should do an import and export as part of the um, boot boot scripts um, when it, when the machine boots up and when it shuts down. If it doesn't, I thoroughly recommend you modify the scripts to include um, an import and export. Um, when you do an import and export, the as you've seen the um, data sets are auto automatically mounted at their mount point. So if this had a custom mount point, it would be remounted at that mount point when you imported the pool. You don't need to go around manually um, importing, uh, sorry, you don't need to go around manually mounting any of the um, data sets that are part of that pool um, when you import. It, it does all that automatically. So again, if I export this, it automatically unmounts any file, any data sets that are part of that pool. And if it can't, it'll let you know. And you obviously, as usual, you'd have to go around and um, find out why that that um, file set, that data set can't be unmounted uh, as part of the export.